Welcome. I'm Lynn Turner, and I'm serving as NCA's first vice president this year. And if I might, I'd like to ask those of you in the back or those of you standing just to move up, if you could. I know. <laughs> no one ever likes to sit in the front. We're so happy to see you here tonight and welcome you to NCA's presidential address and awards presentation, one of our most um, lovely events, I think, where we really celebrate the accomplishments of our members. And my first pleasant task is to introduce our NCA president, Don Braithwaite. I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of biographical information about Dawn before she begins her speech. She received her AA degree from Golden West College and her BA from California State University, Fullerton. She has an MA from uh, the University of, of uh, excuse me, California State University, Long Beach, and a PhD from the University of Minnesota. She has been working at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln since 1998 and was named a Willa Cather Professor of Communication in 2007. Dr. Braithwaite studies how people in family and personal relationships interact and negotiate family change and challenges. Her current work is centered in discourse-dependent and understudied families. She is the author of over 80 articles in referee journals and chapters in scholarly books. Her books include Engaging Theories in Interpersonal Communication with Leslie Baxter, Engaging Theories in Family Communication also with Professor Baxter, The Handbook of Communication um, for people, uh, with People with Disabilities with Teresa Thompson, and Casing Interpersonal Communication, Case Studies in Personal and Social Relationships with Julia Wood. Dr. Braithwaite received the National Communication Association's Bromel Award for Outstanding Scholarship, Service, and Family Communication. She has served on the Board of Directors of the Consortium of Social Science Associations in Washington, D.C., and she is a past president of the Western States Communication Association and a recipient of that association's Distinguished Service Award. Dr. Braithwaite was a member and then director of NCA's research board and has served on NCA's executive committee since 2005. She, as you know, as you can see from that retelling and as you probably know from personal interaction with her, has been an incredible service-minded member of NCA and a distinguished leader of our association. So I'm very pleased to introduce her this evening. As in our past two events, we are webcasting this and, and we will archive it on our website. So if you're interested to download it at some point, maybe share with your colleagues at home or your students, you can certainly do that. And of course, we are joined tonight by a virtual audience. Hello. <laughs> this is my little thing I've done for three nights in a row. So if you've come to everything, which I hope you have, it could be getting a little old. But <laughs> at this point, I am very pleased to turn the podium over to my colleague, Don Braithwaite, who will deliver the presidential address entitled, Moving Toward NCA's 100th, What Ties Carry and Keep Us Together. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to move this. Greetings to all of you, my colleagues and friends from the National Communication Association, especially to the winners of our association's highest awards. 
I send special greetings to one award winner who couldn't be here today, and that's Brant Burleson of Purdue University. Many of you know he's quite ill, and he wanted to be here so badly. But he met with his colleagues yesterday over Skype, and it was just an incredible session as he started talking about his passion for the discipline and his passion for studying communication. And one of the things he said yesterday is, aren't we the luckiest people in the world to study communication? My congratulations and heartfelt gratitude to all who made the San Francisco Convention possible, especially First Vice President Lynn Turner and our convention manager Michelle Randall, who are incredible to work with. And I just want to give them and all of the planners and volunteers a round of applause. Finally, I want to say that NCA, as we know, runs on the expertise and the fuel of just legions of volunteers. And I thank all of you who, to this, for this meeting and through the years, have given such incredible service to NCA. And finally, I recognize all of the NCA past presidents in the room, and I'd like to thank you for your continued leadership, friendship, and wisdom. Thank you for the incredible honor of serving as your president this year. I appreciate the colleagues with whom I've worked during my years in NCA leadership, especially those on the executive committee with whom I work most closely. While we've had our discursive struggles at times, the association is better for it. And I would challenge anybody in this room to find a group of people who care more deeply and passionately about the discipline and association. I also deeply appreciate the staff, past and present, at the, of the National Communication Association in Washington, D.C., for all they do for us. I'm continually impressed and amazed with, with what 14 people can do. I'm also indebted to my colleagues and students and friends at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln for their encouragement and understanding, especially these last few years when I've been absent more than normal. And I want to thank especially Bill Seiler, my department chair, for his constant encouragement and friendship. He really helped make this happen. And finally, I'm grateful to my friends, and my dear friends for their, and colleagues for their support, and especially my husband, Chuck Braithwaite, here, who has given up a lot. Well, maybe presence, my presence is not a lot. Maybe this was a good thing. Um, <laughs> but these have been very demanding years for both of us, and I thank him, and I pay tribute to you, honey. When I was the NCA first vice president last year, one of my duties was to choose the theme for the convention, just as Lynn has for this one. And I chose the theme of discourses of stability and change. And it's a very fitting theme for a dialectical theorist like me, and one that I think is very relevant to our association now, and as NCA moves forward to our centennial coming up in what year? 2014. My, here are my students, they know that. I've also, though, come to realize that this theme of discourses and stability and change has aptly described my time in NCA leadership, especially this year. And I've come to realize what I imagined every NCA president before me realized in his or her own way, that leading the association is hard. Now, that's not any big surprise. And when all is, done, all is said and done, I'm not very surprised by that either. All of us expected to work hard, and we knew that there would be challenges to meet. However, if you talk to the past presidents, and we just had a luncheon today, I imagine you would hear that few of us had anticipated which issues would crop up during our time in leadership, and the things that would turn out to be and, and frame all the most important contributions we made. Those issues that stretched us to the limit of our intellect and skills, those that cost us sleep or more gray hair. I can't imagine that any leader, whether it's association or any other kind of leader, doesn't look back at his or her accomplishments without confronting their own shortcomings as well. Ultimately, all each of us can hope is that we did, in a small measure, made things better. In her Arnold lecture to us last year, Leslie Baxter explained her work in relational dialectics had taken a decidedly critical turn. She explained that the critical turn in relational dialectics is not about contradictions, but about discourses. And she shines a light on discursive struggles of relating. These struggles are not things that are bad or to be avoided. And in reality, we navigate and co-create these in interaction. The critical turn comes, Baxter says, when we engage in discursive struggles over which discourses are privileged and which discourses are silenced or rejected. 
In our research, Leslie and I have critiqued communication theories that have privileged certainty over uncertainty, viewing uncertainty as something bad and to be managed or, or reduced. We've also critiqued approaches to research that privilege seeking similarity over difference. And in contrast, we've argued that we're our best when we can embrace both difference and, uncer and uncertainty. As I've served on the executive committee now for the last six years, I've come to better understand the critical turn of relational dialectics and association, sometimes way more than I wanted to. Yet any difficulties I've encountered have been far outweighed by the feelings of pride, positively, positivity, and hopefulness about NCA and our discipline. In my short talk today, I want to do two things. I want to go back to the time the association was founded and examine the discourses that emerged for us from the very start. Along the way, I'll briefly highlight two discourses of uncertainty and difference. And I believe navigating these and talking about that represents our greatest strengths and our greatest challenges. I've always been interested in the history of our discipline and association, and this knowledge has greatly influenced me as I think about myself as a scholar and a teacher, and was one of my most helpful preparations for becoming NCA president. We don't become who we are in a vacuum, of course we know, and as individual scholars and teachers and universities and departments, disciplines and associations, we're wise to understand our development over time. So we're going to begin with just a little quiz. How, and you'll have to hold up your fingers so I can see. How many names has NCA had since 1914? Hold those hands up high. Award winners, I'm especially looking at you. I've seen four, three, four, f five. My students have got it right right there, and so do many of you. Five. Five names in less than 100 years. Each time we changed our name, we did it for a reason, of course. Do you know the five names? My students do. And I won't make them stand up and recount them, but that would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? But suffice it to say that each time the names change, it reflects a move forward in who we are and how we understand ourselves. And I don't have time to talk about the five names today, but you'll hear a little bit of these changes reflected in my talk. In the early 20th century, there were few departments of speech, but not many. And faculty members taught public speakings at universities and, of course, English departments for the most part. On the 50th anniversary of our association in 1964, Giles Wilkerson Gray, who was then the editor, editor of the Quarterly Journal of Speech, talked about the plight of the public speaking teachers in, the, in those early days. He said that the public speaking teachers were increasingly dissatisfied with how they were be being treated in English, and their frustrations culminated in a revolt on a November day in Chicago in 1913 at the annual meeting of the National Councils of Teachers of English. And those of you who have been to NCA many years know that they meet at the Congress Hotel, which if, in the room I stayed in one time looks exactly the same today as it probably did in 1913. Gray talks about this, and he said it was the clash of two divergent points of view within the National Council that led to the final rebellion. One group held that speech and English were essentially identical. Another group held with equal insistence that while English and speech had much in common, there were also points of no contact. In his excellent book, Democracy is Discussion, Bill Keith quotes James Winans of Cornell University, who described the culture of isolation in which the public speakers operated. And here's what Winans said. Every teacher stayed in his own little corner, hugging on to his own pet system, and believing that all the other fellows were nitwits and freaks. His own extreme insistence upon his own little system of eternal truth was partly, partly due, in fact, that he had an inferiority complex. His own community jeered at him, his, or best ignored him, as one who had nothing of consequence. And to maintain self-respect, he had to insist that he had something incredibly precious. Winans explains why attending conferences was so important to these early public speaking teachers. And he said these teachers were often in a lonely soul for lack of colleagues who took a lively interest in his work. Hence, conferences fulfilled a real need. James O'Neill, who became the first president of our association, gave a speech at that 1913 convention of the, of the English Association. And he was responding to a speech given by an English press professor the year before. And this is what O'Neill recalls. The speaker took the position that the only hope for the future of teaching public speaking was to have it completely under the English department with well-trained teachers of English giving instruction. 
I claimed that the only academically respectable work in public speaking was being done by teachers who were on their own, wholly independent of the English department or any other department. What we needed was independent departments, an independent professional association, and a, a professional journal, teacher training, and graduate work. As I was talking, I knew I was getting what is known as a mixed reception, which is what I expected, and I concluded with a quote from Mr. Dooley. If I've said anything I'm sorry for, I'm glad of it. <laughs> O'Neill said when he wrote this, I'm still glad today. I'm glad I made that speech in 1913, which failed to please the majority of my audience. By the 1913 English meeting, dissatisfaction with English had clearly increased. The public speaking teachers asked NCTE for conference programming presented by one of their own. Just as today, everybody fights for those convention slots. Their request was denied. The next day, a committee was appointed to explore forming their own association. And I note here that the group that the Eastern Association had formed a few years before. At this meeting, 17 members adopted a resolution to withdraw from NCTE and established our first name. Anybody know what it is? The National Association of the Teachers of Public Speaking, of Academic Teachers of Public Speaking, you're right. Once the association was founded, the challenges had only begun. What would be the mission of this new association and discipline if, if they were to become one? I highly recommend, if you've never read it, Herman Cohen's book, The History of Speech Communication, The Emergence of a Discipline, 1914 to 1945, if you've never read it. Cohen presents a detailed account of the debates about what the discipline should be. He said, the association, however, faced a fundamental problem in meeting its objective. The members of the profession had done no research. It's not all at all clear they even knew what research was or how to conduct it. In contrast to most of the disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, public speaking was a performance field with little or no theoretical background, and it was now seeking the means to become a research field. Several members of the brand new research committee recommended a push toward pure science, as in sociology and psychology. Cohen argues that this, these early debates had a long-standing effect on our discipline. And even today, arguments persist about whether we have borrowed too many of our theories and research methods from other disciplines. We're still trying to figure out whether this is a weakness of our discipline or a testament to our interdisciplinarity. Cohen also chronicles at length the arguments that raged in the early association about the tensions between research and teaching. He plays out an extended debate between Everett Hunt and James Winans about re whether research had any place in the new discipline. Hunt envisioned public speaking as a teaching field and argued for it. And Winans and others argued that the importance of research, if for no other reason, it was the only way they could gain academic respectability. These debates raged over which paradigm to use, uh, our roots were coming out of English and humanistic approaches, and other argued for social science. And Charles Wilbert joined the fray and took on Hunt. Wilbert would earn his PhD in psychology from Harvard a few years hence and saw the move to social science as a way to distance from English. These early discussions that I've just given you a small taste are fascinating and important. They had public speaking classes to teach, but now an association, and the fledgling, dis fledgling discipline, if we could call it that, lacked research. They didn't have a clear vision of between social science and humanities, if to do research and how, and no theoretical base from which to operate. They were going to need to import the best they could from rhetoric, history, education, sociology, psychology, and other disciplines. And I've always thought it must have been an exciting, frustrating, confusing, and daunting time. One of the most interesting sections to me in Cohen's book is a well-developed argument concerning how we became so reliant on the methods and theories of psychology, and he explains Wilbert's central role in that development. He also talks about a woman named Mary Yost, who likely was the first person in the new association to earn a PhD, hers in sociology. And she, he, develop, he presents her argument to shift from pu just public speaking and audience to a focus on group and social situation. But she was drowned out by the others. In these early discussions then formed the basis for our growth as a discipline, as well as many of our greatest challenges in the years to come, and I think even today. We still struggle with what we should be studying and how, teaching or research, humanities or social science, unique or interdisciplinary. 
In his opening talk on the state of the discipline on Sunday night, David Zarefsky helped us ponder our current thinking about these very questions. The dialectical theorist in me, of course, says not either or, but both and, and in many ways the debate rages on. But this very small snippet of disciplinary history helps me conclude some things about us. First, we were born of rebellion. Our founders were not satisfied with the status quo and they wanted change. Second, we were born of risk and sacrifice. It would have been much safer and easier to probably stay in the English department and association rather than strike out and create something of our own. Third, we were born of the belief that there is something unique about speech. Our founders knew that speech was more than an English essay on its feet. Fourth, we were born of insecurity. We descend from a people who lack confidence and had something to prove. And fifth, we were born of professional isolation. We descend from people who needed to affiliate. As I look at our history of risk and rebellion and sacrifice, belief in something unique and worth studying, insecurity and isolation, I see parallels and lessons from each of these pillars on which we were built. Those of you who know me know I do like to try to find the positives in life. And I can't say that that's always an easy thing to do. However, I do see some challenges from our past that help us understand our challenges in the present that will help us create our future. So in the time we have left today, I'd like to focus on two dialectical discourses that I believe challenge us today and move us toward our centennial. The first is navigating discourses of uncertainty. What is our impetus to relate? And the second is navigating discourses of difference around what do we cohere. In thinking about this first discourse, navigating discourses of uncertainty, what is our impetus to, to relate, I can't help but be influenced by my standpoint as a relational communication scholar and teacher. To me, one of the great lessons from our association's history is how important it was for our founders to associate. I can't help but think that leaving the certainty of the English th Association was risky, and I can't imagine that that rebellion did not bleed over into daily life when these people went back home. And our founders were clearly tired of feeling isolated and like second-class citizens, and they were willing to embrace uncertainty and sacrifice to be with like-minded people. What about today? We have the comfort of our own university programs and our large and healthy association because of the courage of the founders' convictions and sacrifices. Unlike the situation at our beginning, today we have so many choices to make, whether to join our professional association and which ones to join. Given the large number of journal outlets, we choose where to submit our best scholarship. We decide where, whether to spend the time and money to travel to our conventions. We look for certainty in our professional relationships, and I think sometimes it's easy to take our professional associations like NCA for granted, to let memberships slip for a year or two because we can get our journals electronically, or drop a membership altogether when an association disappoints or angers us for any number of reasons. For me, I'm a member of my professional associations, NCA, WSCA, CSCA, it's a lot of A's, ICA, and my specialized uh, uh, associations because of their support of my scholarship and because I believe it's important that we support their goals. However, I elevate my membership in NCA above all the others and I put my identity here because of relationships. I'm thinking about relationships in two different ways. First, with all due respect to the other associations, NCA is the place where I establish my strongest relationship to the discipline. It's the association that publishes the largest number and diversity of journals, provides support for professional development for us as teachers, provides program guidelines, outreach and advocacy for the discipline, supports the breadth of the career from clubs to undergraduates to emeritus sections for our retired professors. In short, the list could go on and on. While all of the associations are important to us and make a contribution, NCA, in my mind, is a phrase I've used before, the keeper of the discipline in this way. Second, NCA is the place where I have the greatest number of personal and professional relationships in the discipline. I personally hold as, pre as precious the per per personal and professional relationships my membership in the discipline affords me. And NCA is the association where the greatest number of you come together and we associate. 
Our annual convention is just one aspect of this opportunity to relate and where I'll be able to interact with people from across the breadth of the discipline. Each year, I don't know about you, but I look forward to coming to the annual convention. Yeah, it's big and it's unwieldy at times, but where else am I going to be able to celebrate the relationships that my membership in the discipline brings? Where else am I going to be able to connect with the breadth of scholars whose work I admire, many of them sitting right here re receiving awards tonight? How else am I going to be able to be the most available to give to the association and meet and talk with young scholars or anybody who might benefit from my scholarship and input? How else am I meaningfully going to enact my membership in the discipline? I look around this room tonight and I see so many people who are important to me. And as I prepared for this talk, I thought especially about my dear professors and mentors who have contributed so much to my life and career. Every year I look forward to coming to NDCA to be able to see my mentors, and I imagine you do the same. I think about my community college professors, and two of them are here today, Ruth Hunter and Sharon Ratliff, if you'd stand really quickly. Ruth and Sharon are from Golden West College in Huntington Beach, California. I met Ruth when I was 18 years old. They gave me my academic start, and along with Sheldon Nyman, who invited me to co-author on a paper when I was a community college student, and that paper was presented at the WSCA conference, my first convention paper when I was an undergraduate. Dan Canary represents my undergraduate years at California State University, Fullerton. And Dan was my teaching assistant, and I worked with him, and he was really adorable with all this dark curly hair. Oh, I digress. <laughs> I wouldn't be here tonight without Dan and the faculty members like Bob Emery, Lucy Keel, Joyce Flocken, and Norman Page. And I reflect so often about the contributions and the mentorship of the incredible Wayne Brockrady, my mentor, and, and Richard Weissman, who left us all too soon. Dick Porter, I can't believe he sat in the back, I'm going to ask you to stand, Dick Porter, is my representative for my master's faculty at California State University, Long Beach. <laughs> Dick has been my academic dad for all of these years, and he represents a great number of faculty members there, including Carl Anatol, Earl Kane, and Owen Jensen, who mean so much to me. Sandra Petronio is right here, and I'll ask her to stand, representing the faculty from the University of Minnesota. These people helped me become a scholar. See, <laughs> so if you have any beefs about it, go see Dr. Petronio. I can't imagine um, my life and career without them. And Sandra is an incredible mentor and friend. She represents faculty like Charles Bance, Bob Scott, Vern Jensen, David Rarick, Judith Martin, George Shapiro, and Don Brown. And I honor my dear advisor, Ernest Borman, to whom I owe so much. At this point in my career, one of the greatest delights of my year is coming to the NDA convention to see my, also my former students, of whom I am so incredibly proud. You are a continual joy and blessing to me. When I add to those relationships my relationships with so many of you that I've met and worked with with the association, it's a bit overwhelming at times. I just cannot imagine my life and career without you and all of these relationships. And you are the biggest reason that I come to NCA each year. And I want to see all of you. I want to stay up late and drink beverages with my buddies. <laughs> I want to laugh and talk. I want to debate ideas, hear about your work, and learn from all of you. So for me, I'm a member of NCA and my other associations for the people, the relationships. And after all, I met my dear husband Chuck Braithwaite at the WSCA convention, and we actually were engaged at that convention in 1984. Okay, I admit it, I'm an association nerd. But I suspect I'm not alone in this room, and I think all of you have similar stories to mine. I'll always be grateful to those 17 rebellious souls who walked out in 1913. The association that they founded has brought relational richness to our lives and careers, and we will best honor their sacrifice and work by our commitment to the discipline, association, and to each other. To accomplish this, we have to embrace discourses of uncertainty. We have real challenges facing us as an association. We're working to examine best ways to structure and govern the association as we move into the second decade of the 21st century. 
We struggle with how to be good members of our association and good citizens in our communities, and as we think about how and where to hold conventions. We work at how to best envision uh, what will face us in a certain city or state when, as we book convention sites five to seven years in advance. Here we are holding a convention in the midst of a boycott situation. It has not been easy for the association's leadership or our members. But we've worked hard to navigate the waters the very best we can. And I'm grateful to those who have contacted us with their concerns, suggestion, and their appreciation. These challenges will not leave us, and it will take the best of all of our good minds as we, as we move forward. We have to embrace and navigate the discourses of uncertainty to stay together. If we wait for certainty until the association has solved every problem that bothers us, until the, until the conditions are just right, there will be no association. In any given year, we will have disagreements about what the association should do. That doesn't let us off the hook with working hard to make it the best it can be. And it also, friends, doesn't let us off the hook with engaging our ch challenges and our uncertainties with civil discourse. I do challenge NCA members to become involved in leadership in the association and help us address these challenges. And I hope all members will at least entertain the notion that those in volunteer leadership and our staff in Washington, D.C. are persons of goodwill. Not perfect persons, at least I know I'm not, but ones working hard and to the best of their abilities for the good of the association and the discipline. We need all good minds and hearts working together to make NCA the best it can be. The second dialectical discourse I want to address is navigating discourses of difference around what do we cohere. We certainly come far since 1914 in a disciplinary focus in teaching just on public speaking. With the incredible breadth of our members, the scholarship, and activities, we do need to keep an eye on our central focus with, uh, as an association and a discipline. What makes us unique around what do we cohere? Perhaps for me, nobody addressed this better than Bob Craig's article in 1999 in Communication Theory. And in brief, many of you know this article, Bob Craig described, described our lack of center as a discipline as we go about our business within smaller knots of scholars, often ignoring everybody else. He described that too often there's no consensus on communication theory as a field. He was hopeful, however. Craig argued that a field will emerge to the extent that we increasingly engage as communication theorists with socially important goals, questions, and controversies that cut across various traditions, specialties, methodologies, and schools of thought that often divide us. Craig challenged us to consider around what do we cohere as a discipline, and I've thought about this for a long time. He argues the way that he thinks about it is communication as the primary constitutive social process. In my own way in thinking and talking about it, this constitutive social process is how humans co-construct their selves, relationships, organizations, publics, and cultures. We can act and enact our unique contributions to understanding communication only when we negotiate and embrace a dialectic of difference. And in order to address this question of coherence, the NSA Research Board sponsored a panel that asked, what is unique or distinctive about our discipline? And coming out of this panel was an edited book by uh, Donald Carbaugh and Pratish Busnell in 2009 entitled, not surprisingly, Distinctive Qualities of Communication Research. And it's an excellent book. In their introduction to this book, Patrice and Donald say this, in an era of budget cuts and surveys of departments' reputations, deeds and administrative leaders sometimes ask what a department of communication offers that's distinctive in its conception and conduct of inquiry. Funding agencies like the National Science Foundation read proposals and ask what a communication study contributes to particular social issues. What does a communication researcher add to such a research team, they wonder. Each such moment provides an opportunity for communication researchers to say what is distinctive about the communication research, its philosophy, theory, methodology, and findings. I believe our scholarship and teaching is best when we focus on the practical implications of communication scholarship in the everyday life of people in our personal, social, and cultural communities. And I was really encouraged to read the 2010 Joint Forum in Communication Monographs in JACR this year on Does Communication Research Make a Difference? This kind of introspection can only make us better. 
The question about what is distinctive about the study of communication is one that all of us should be concerned about. It's not a question I can answer here unless you'd like to be here for a long time. But I believe it's one that we must confront and ponder as we navigate and celebrate discourses of uncertainty and difference. What does the future hold for us in the next 100 years? Working on this address, I've tried to envision it. As Hunt, Winans, and Wilbert were verbally slugging it out over questions of how to teach public speaking and research and do research, in their wildest dreams, I can doubt that they could imagine a discipline 100 years down the road. Could they have imagined communication departments with 400, 800, 1,200 majors? Could they imagine that this association would have almost 8,000 members and 1,200 convention programs every year? In the end, we can trace the development of the National Communication Association through a series of discursive struggles built by and large by moving forward, being inclusive, and seeking to make a difference. We do need to know this history of our association because it's central to understanding our ident the disciplinary identity and our place in it. To me, the fact that we've changed names five times in less than 100 years reflects some of our continuing unrest about who we are as a discipline and what we want to become. I think it speaks to some of the insecurity as well that's plagued us from the very beginning, and I believe that some of that insecurity continues today. Despite our struggles and challenges, I can still think of nothing more important to study and teach than communication. And as I listened to Brant say that yesterday, I, I heartily, heartily agree. What will we become in the next five years when we reach our centennial? How about at 125, 150, 200? Will we have a new name or two? What, what, what will we study and teach that we've not even dreamed or imagined today? Those of us who are fortunate enough to study communication and to be communication scholars, teachers, and students are doing something that we know is important to people's personal, professional, and public lives. We need to be overcome our differences and insecurities and to embrace uncertainty and difference. And we need to fight to stay together, even when we believe the association has let us down. We need to take personal and collective ownership of our association because it's taking personal and collective ownership of the discipline. And we need to work to make it better. We need a strong national association and this will be our best way of honor honoring our past and leaving a strong legacy for those who follow us in the future. I personally believe that our future is bright. Thank you. point in the meeting do a switch I, gotta find one. I get to stop talking and I get to start listening to Lynn but I've lost here we go Lynn Turner of course will become our president at the end of this calendar year and uh, I enjoy working with Lynn and I'm there to support her and madam president to be this is your gavel oh my goodness thank you very much Don congratulations <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours <laughs> Now, normally you might be thinking I would gavel us to a close, but no, <laughs> we have much more. Uh, but first, I'd just like to thank Don very much for um, the great insights I felt that I gained from both her optimistic framing, because she, as she admitted, is an optimist, and the historical perspective that her remarks lent. And um, so they've been helpful to me, as she has been very helpful to me throughout uh, my time on the executive committee. And now we begin with our awards. The Bernard J. Brommel Award for Outstanding Scholarship or Distinguished Service in Family Communication recognizes an individual who has made an outstanding contribution to the area of family communication. And the award this year is presented to Corey Floyd of Arizona State University. Professor Floyd has demonstrated a strong record of accomplishment. 
In addition to his service as editor of the Journal of Family Communication, Professor Floyd has amassed a prolific record of research. Perhaps most impressive is the substantive contribution of his work. As one of his nominators succinctly stated, he is the premier authority on closeness and affection in relationships, as well as the premier authority on biosocial <laughs> research. <laughs> His nominator was correct. <laughs> so we would like to extend congratulations, Professor Floyd. Well deserved. The Charles H. Wolbert Research Award, and it was very fun to hear Don talk about those awards as real people. <laughs> The Wolbert uh, Research Award is presented to an NCA member who has published a journal article or book chapter which has stood the test of time and has become the stimulus for new conceptualizations of speech communication phenomena. This year, the award is presented to Dennis K. Mumby of the University of North Carolina for his work, Modernism, Postmodernism, and Communication Studies, a rereading of an ongoing debate, which was published. <laughs> which was published in Communication Theory in 1997. The award committee recognizes this article for its conceptualization of key differences among communication research traditions. As the committee writes, in making clear why past simplifications were problematic and weaving together the epistemological, ontological, and political commitments that animate research into distinct discursive positionings, he offers communication scholars a compelling way to respectfully understand their differences. Congratulations, <laughs> Professor Mumbay. The Diamond Anniversary Book Award is presented to the author of the most outstanding scholarly book published during the last two years. The award this year is presented to Deborah, Deborah Hawhey of Penn State University for her book, Moving Bodies, Kenneth Burke at the Edges of Language. Unfortunately, Professor Hahi is not able to be with us tonight, but Thomas Benson will be accepting the award on her behalf. <laughs> One of Professor Hahi's nominators said, Deborah Hahi offers a challenging new reading <clears throat> of Kenneth Burke, and through him, a fresh and original investigation of body criticism, language, and rhetoric. Congratulations to Deborah Hai. The Donald P. Cushman Memorial Award is designed to recognize Professor, Professor Cushman's mentorship of students with respect to excellence in scholarship and socialization as scholars in the communication discipline. This award honors the top-ranked student-authored paper from all NCA units that competitively rank papers at the convention this year. And we are pleased to present this award to Elizabeth Linnigan of Northwestern University for her, her paper entitled, Making Material Matter how contemporary collectors remediate the medium of the book. Her study examines the role of new media and the relationship of the digital world uh, in, in together that with contemporary book collectors via an ethnographic study of Chicago's oldest book collecting society, the Caxton Club. She engaged in extended interviews with book collectors and dealers. The reviewers considered this paper a superb example of ethnographic inquiry about a very important topic. 
Furthermore, they were impressed that this ethnography digs into the deep associations between culture and text and provides crucial insights into the relationships among knowledge, aesthetics, and technologies. Congratulations, Elizabeth Lennigan. The Douglas W. Enninger Distinguished Rhetorical Scholar Award honors scholars who have executed research programs in rhetorical theory, rhetorical criticism, and or public address studies. This award is given to a person who through multiple publications and presentations around a rhetorical topic or theme demonstrates intellectual creativity, perseverance, and impact on the academic community. And this award is presented this year to Craig R. Smith of California State University, Long Beach. <laughs> Professor Smith has established a body of scholarship in rhetorical theory and criticism, public address, and freedom of speech that includes over a dozen books and more than 60 journal articles and book chapters. From innovative studies of Daniel Webster's rhetoric to theoretical work bridging classical rhetoric with continental philosophy, Professor Smith's work is well known as both meticulous in its argumentation and accessible to academic and public audiences alike. The impact of Professor Smith's First Amendment scholarship beyond the academic community is demonstrated by its use in congressional hearings and a National Press Foundation Award recipient describes Smith's work, which was entitled Freedom of Expression and Partisan Politics, as a must-read argument for members of the media. Congratulations, Professor Smith. The Gerald M. Phillips Award for Distinguished Applied Communication Scholarship recognizes the author of a body of published research and creative scholarship in applied communication. The award this year is presented to Charles K. Atkin of Michigan State University. Dr. Atkin is professor and chair of the Department of Communication Arts and Sciences at Michigan State. He has dedicated his career to studying mass media campaigns, particularly within the health domain. Professor Atkin's campaign against binge drinking at Michigan State University over the years has demonstrated that social norms campaigns can be used to reduce alcohol consumption. Based on the significance of Atkin's drinking campaign research, the United States Department of Education selected Michigan State as a model program for other universities across the country. Professor Atkin has also spent many years examining how to best create campaign messages that reduce breast cancer risk. His research exemplifies the Phillips Award because it has made a real difference in the health of others. Congratulations, Charles Atkin. <laughs> the Gerald R. Miller Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award recognizes new scholars who have recently completed their dissertations. The award is presented this year to three individuals, Marsha Alisan Dawkins from California State University Fullerton, Victor Picard, <laughs> all your alma mater. Oh. Victor Picard of New York University and Jennifer Pram of the University of Texas, Austin. <laughs> Marsha Allison Dawkins' dissertation, in purely raced, purely erased toward a rhetorical theory of biracial passing is, as her nominators say, stunningly original. 
Each of the case studies is riveting. But more than anything, the way she moves between theorizing about the rhetoric of passing and passing as rhetoric is an intellectual tour de force. She shows that passing itself is a productive way to understand the essential theoretical tension in rhetoric. Congratulations, Marcia Dawkins. Victor Picard's dissertation, Media Democracy Deferred, the Post-War Settlement for U.S. Communications, 1945 to 1949, calls into question many of our assumptions about the natural condition of American mass communication as profit-driven, controlled by private corporations, and supported by advertising. As such, it not only forces a reevaluation of communication history, it forces a rethinking of the way we approach the great policy issues facing Americans today. Congratulations. <laughs> Jennifer Pram's dissertation is called The Illocutionary Force of Hurt and Support in young adult romantic relationships, message features, message perceptions, and physiological stress. Her focus on the link between interpersonal communication and biological manifestations of stress provide important insights into how experiences within personal relationships affect people's health. In doing so, she locates communication as essential to understanding well-being. Congratulations, Jennifer Graham. <laughs> the Golden Anniversary Monograph Award was created in 1964 to mark NCA's 50th anniversary. The award is presented to the most outstanding scholarly monographs published during the previous calendar year. This year, the award is presented to two individuals, Charles Morris of Boston College for his monograph, Hard Evidence, the Vexations of Lincoln's Queer Corpus in Rhetoric, Materiality, and Politics, and Lester C. Olson of the University of Pittsburgh for pictorial representations of British America resisting rape rhetorical recirculation of a print series portraying the Boston Port Bill of 1774, which was published in Rhetoric and Public Affairs. Unfortunately, Dr. Morris is unable to be with us tonight, and Dale Herbeck will accept this award on his behalf. Professor Morris's article carries broad implications for communication research. With rhetorical vigor, his essay offers a unique perspective on the role of evidence in rhetorical histories. We send our congratulations to Professor Morris. Lester Olson's monograph is a significant contribution to scholarship in visual rhetoric. His essay provides a historically rich, critically nuanced, and theoretically important analysis of early American visual rhetoric. His piece is substantial, innovative and interdisciplinary, and the essay serves as a model for the rhetorical interpretation of persuasive images. Congratulations. The James A. Winans Herbert A. Wichlin's Memorial Award honors distinguished scholarship in rhetoric and public address. The award is presented this year to Robert Asin of the University of Wisconsin for his work invoking the invisible hand, social security, and privatization debates. Unfortunately, um, Professor Asin is not able to be here tonight, but Stephen Lucas will be accepting the award on his behalf. In 
In invoking the invisible hand, ASIN scrutinizes contemporary debates over proposals to privatize Social Security. And he reveals the ways in which our language is deployed to identify problems for public policy, craft policy solutions, and promote policies to the populace. An award committee member said that Robert Asin's book is a complete and important discussion of a contemporary public policy debate that is both insightful and compelling. Congratulations to Professor Asin. The James L. Golden Outstanding Student Essay in Rhetoric Award uh, recognizes outstanding essays touching on the history, theory, or criticism of rhetoric. Eligible essayists are undergraduate or pre-master's graduate students. And the award this year is presented to Elliot Heilman of Northwestern University, yay Northwestern, <laughs> For negotiating the eye in Compromito Estradancia, I may have mangled that just a bit, I'm sorry, toward an organic synthesis of the particular. I did try to rehearse that. <laughs> Reviewers called Mr. Hillman's essay an impressive, very sophisticated analysis, a focused case study. The essay is, in the words of another reviewer, particularly impressive for balancing all three aspects of mature scholarship in rhetoric, historical reconstruction of the context, insightful critical attention to the fine details of the text, and theoretical interest. Congratulations, Elian Holland. The Carl R. Wallace Memorial Award is designed to foster and promote philosophical, historical, or critical scholarship in rhetoric and public discourse. Eligible nominees are re recent PhDs or advanced doctoral students. The award this year is presented to Lisa, Lisa B. Kiernan of the University of Colorado Denver for envisioning viral apocalypse, a rhetorical history of biological weapons from World War II to the war on terror. Lisa's husband couldn't be here for the award ceremony, but he sent roses. <laughs> That's so nice. <laughs> This project chronicles the rise of biological weapons. It charts the ascendance of viral apocalypse as a recurrent and recognizable cultural form that drives biodefense research and development in ways that reconfigure the relationship between biology and the state. One reviewer commented that Dr. Karanon's project has the potential to put public address scholarship on the front line of the debate on the war on terror. Dr. Karanan believes her project will complicate nuclear studies by analyzing discourse and weapons that grew up in the shadow of the bomb, by analyzing and interpenetrating discourses of infection and security, illuminating how biological weapons play a vexing role in contemporary geopolitical issues, and the Carl W.R. Wallace Committee shares her enthusiasm for this project. Congratulations. <laughs> the Leslie Irene Kojer Award for Distinguished Performance is given to a director, producer, teacher, or performer who has contributed an outstanding body of live performances. And the award this year is presented to E. Patrick Johnson, again, of Northwestern University. <laughs> the 
Dr. Johnson is Professor of Performance Studies in African American Studies at Northwestern, and he also serves as Chair for the Northwestern Department of Performance Studies. He is, in the words of his nominator, an exceptional performer who rigorously combines his professional performances with his award-winning scholarship. The Performance Studies Division is privileged to honor Dr. Johnson's accomplishments with this award tonight for distinguished performance. Congratulations, E. Patrick Johnson. The Lilla A. Heston Award is for Outstanding Scholarship in Interpretation and Performance Studies. The award is presented this year to Mindy Fenske of the University of South Carolina. <laughs> Professor Fenske's scholarship is at the intersection of performance studies and visual rhetoric. Her book, Tattoos in American Visual Culture, has been met with critical acclaim, and her scholarship on ethics and performance-centered theory has been recognized as visionary. Throughout all her scholarship, Mindy Fenske integrates courageous arguments with intellectual rigor and a flair for the nuances of contemporary culture. Congratulations, Mindy Fenske. <laughs> The Mark L. Knapp Award in Interpersonal Communication recognizes individuals who have made significant scholarly contributions to the study of interaction and or relational processes and has contributed to the quality of interpersonal communication through active involvement in the discipline, significant mentoring of students, and or public service, service focused on interpersonal communication. The award is presented this year to Brant Burleson of Purdue University, and as Don mentioned, Brant was unable to be here, uh, but Amanda Holstrom will be accepting the award on his behalf. In his 28-year career, Professor Burleson has established himself as one of the discipline's most prominent and influential interpersonal communication scholars. He has published 135 articles and book chapters, co-edited two significant handbooks, and three volumes of the Communication Yearbook, ranking him among the 15 most productive scholars in communication. His groundbreaking work on supportive communication, comforting, and social skills has earned him numerous top paper, article, and book awards from NCA, ICA, and the International Network on Personal Relationships, as well as election as a fellow of ICA and designation as a distinguished scholar in NCA. The award committee was unanimous in its assessment that Professor Burleson's prodigious scholarship, awards, and honors and prestigious invited talks truly warranted this special recognition for his contributions to interpersonal communication. Congratulations. The Stephen E. Lucas Debut Publication Award aims to honor a contribution to the discipline by an author or team of authors publishing a first scholarly book or monograph. The award is presented this year to Melanie Lowing of Indiana University and Jeff Motter of Appalachian State University for their work, Publics, Counterpublics, and The Promise of Democracy, published in Philosophy and Rhetoric. Low Wing and Motter interrogate the ways that the scholarly debate around Habermas's perspective in structural transformation of the public sphere has been limited by a narrow focus 
on the relationship between publics and counterpublics. Focusing on Habermas's later work in On Facts and Norms, the authors draw a distinction between a problem-solving model of democracy and a culture-generating paradigm. In this, they highlight the relevance of the latter. Lowing and Motter's piece is an exemplar for first-time scholarly work. Congratulations to you both. The Community College Outstanding Educator Award recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to education at community colleges and who exemplify excellence in teaching, scholarship, and service to the profession. This year, the award is presented to Thomas Bovino of Suffolk County Community College. Thomas Bovino has been at Suffolk County Community College for 10 years. In that time, he has taught a variety of courses and developed several new ones. He is the academic chair for his department and has served his campus, college, and community in myriad ways. He has served on numerous committees, often in leadership positions. In addition, he has served NCA in several leadership roles and is currently involved with four different, count them, four different NCA committees. And in the words of one of his uh, nominators, Professor Bovino is the perfect professor. Con <laughs> Congratulations, Tom. The Donald H. Ackroyd Award for Outstanding Teaching in Higher Education is presented this year to Dale A. Herbeck of Boston College and Carleen Corse Campbell of the University of Minnesota. The many letters written on Dr. Herbeck's behalf by both former students and current students as well as colleagues make clear the impact he has had on so many in the discipline. One former student stated he is an inspiring educator who challenges his students to think critically and communicate effectively. Another indicated that Professor Herbeck has the ability to successfully impart knowledge to his students but also has the rare talent for inspiring students to greatness, supporting them in their own educational aspirations and truly caring about them both as students and as individuals. Yet another student said that Professor Herbeck's approachable teaching style and high level of expertise made him one of the most sought after professors at the college. Dale Herbeck has demonstrated a sense of humor, organization, willingness to advise and mentor students, availability outside the classroom, a concern for students, and a generosity and passion for teaching. In sections of over 100 students and in classes as small as 10, Herbeck's teaching evaluations say it all. As one individual noted, challenging, approachable, and kind, Dr. Herbeck is both a first-rate professor and a tremendous human being. Congratulations. <laughs> the impact Carlin Course Campbell has had on countless in this discipline is evident through the letters of support received from her students and colleagues. A few illustrative quotes. Most of, which I, most of what I know about teaching I learned from her. She makes her courses into an intellectual adventure. She is the consummate teacher, advisor, mentor, and life coach for so very many. In the classroom she is simply magical. 
I worked harder in her classes than in any others, and I am better for it because she offset that rigor with feedback and encouragement that empowered us. She is an outstanding scholar who brings her love of scholarship to her teaching and is an outstanding mentor who sees teaching as extending far beyond the far walls of a classroom. Carlin Course Campbell has been characterized by her students as, and colleagues as demanding, rigorous, generous, eloquent, engaging, and supportive. Many mentioned her <laughs> Many mentioned her apparently famous red pen with great appreciation for her mentorship. In addition, her contributions to the discipline through her groundbreaking scholarship have had profound impact on our discipline, and both students and faculty alike have benefited from her research. Congratulations, Professor Campbell. <laughs> the Marcella E. Overly Award for Outstanding Teaching in Grades K through 12 honors teachers who have exhibited both outstanding teaching and a commitment to the speech communication profession. The award is presented this year to Elizabeth G. Hansen of Grinnell High School. Elizabeth Hansen has taught speech, theater, and language arts at Grinnell High School since 1986. During her tenure, she has been an outstanding teacher, forensics coach, and theater director. She has worked on the local, state, and national levels to improve oral communication and theater instruction. Her principal, Kevin Senny, writes, Ms. Hansen's classes are by far the most popular classes among the students at Grinnell High School. All of her students will admit that the skills that they develop under Ms. Hansen's tutelage are the most valuable and relevant skills they have gained in high school. While many teachers of similar experience and success might rest on their laurels, Ms. Hansen is continuing to hone her art of teaching. She spends weeks on end in the summer assessing her teaching from the previous year and planning to engage her students on a higher level for the next year. Thus, the high expectations she has for her students are also indicative of the expectations she maintains for herself. Congratulations, Elizabeth Hansen. The Robert J. Kibler Memorial Award recognizes someone with the personal and professional qualities of dedication to excellence, commitment to the profession, concern for others, vision of what could be, acceptance of diversity, and forthrightness. This year, the award is presented to Karen A. Foss of the University of New Mexico. Professor Foss's career offers compelling evidence of the qualities the Kibler Award is intended to honor. Her dedication to excellence has been recognized with numerous awards for research, teaching, and mentoring. Her commitment to the profession is evident in her many service leadership roles. Her concern for others is legendary, including her extensive mentoring and the collaborative, caring relationships she creates with her colleagues on campus and throughout the discipline. Beyond her personal acceptance of, di of diversity, she has challenged the boundaries of the field and challenged structures that do not support diversity. As one of her colleagues wrote of her qualities and influence, for the past 13 years, I have learned how to be a productive and a compassionate faculty member from Professor Foss. Congratulations, Karen.
The Samuel L. Becker Distinguished Service Award honors an NCA member who has given outstanding service in re research, teaching, and or service to both NCA and the profession. The award this year is presented Sherwin Morreale of the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. <laughs> Sherry Morreale has provided many years of vital service to the communication discipline and to the National, Association, National Communication Association in particular. As Associate Director of NCA from 1997 to 2005, Dr. Morreale collaborated closely with nearly all standing NCA committees and offered extensive support for their work. She helped link the association and many of its boards to external funding agencies, government organizations, and other professional associations. She played a central role in authoring NCA publications that have been valuable for communication research and pedagogy. These efforts together with her own publications and professional activities across her career have made outstanding contributions to both NCA and to the profession. Congratulations, Sherry. The Distinguished Scholar Award recognizes and rewards a lifetime of scholarly achievement in the study of communication. Recipients of this award showcase our profession, and it is my pleasure to announce that the 2010 recipients of this honor are John A. Daly of the University of Texas, Austin, Stephen W. Duck of the University of Iowa, Karen Tracy of the University of Colorado Boulder, and Joseph Turow of the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> A former NCA president, Professor John Daly, is the Liddell Professor of Communication and a distinguished teaching professor at the University of Texas at Austin. He is a fellow in the International Communication Association and he has received numerous awards for his scholarship. He is also acclaimed as a brilliant, engaging teacher who has received many campus, regional, and national teaching awards, including NCA's own Eckright Award for the Outstanding Teacher in Higher Education. A prolific researcher and writer, Professor Daly has authored or edited 12 books and more than 130 journal articles and book chapters. Professor Daly has more, made more than 300 presentations at conferences and scholarly meetings and has served as editor for two journals, including NCA's journal Communication Education. His research has been funded by more than $1.5 million in grant money. It has addressed a broad range of topics in the communication discipline, including aspects of communication pedagogy, written communication, the measurement and management of communication anxiety, and communication in close personal relationships. Daly has been a leading authority on the causes and remediation of communication apprehension for more than 30 years, and his work in this area has had widespread impact. He has also made very important contributions to our understanding of conversational interaction, including work on memory for conversations, conversational competence, the structure of conversation, and methods for the study of conversation. In addition, his line of research has addressed several topics relating to effective communication in organizational settings, including leadership, teamwork, and customer service. In sum, his prolific research has focused on clarifying, illuminating, and helping to solve numerous communication problems that crop up in diverse life contexts, close relationships, business, the classroom, service organizations, and written documents. His scholarship and teaching have contributed significantly to the advancement of communication skills and the betterment of life, and have further contributed to advancing the discipline of communication 
in education, government, and industry. Congratulations, Professor Dalai. After earning degrees at Oxford and Sheffield, Professor Steve Duck began his scholarly career in 1971 in the United Kingdom. In 1986, he joined the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Iowa. Professor Duck is one of the most important scholars in the area of interpersonal communication, and his influence is due not only to his own significant scholarship, but also to his investments in developing structures to support scholarship and teaching about communication and human relationships. One of his greatest contributions has been in establishing the Journal of Social and Personal Relationships, which he founded in 1982, and for which he served as editor until 1998. Under his editorship, the journal became the premier journal for research on human relationships, and it retains that distinction today. In the 1980s, Professor Duck was also instrumental in building the International Network on Personal Relationships, which in 2004 merged with the International Society for the Study of Personal Relationships to become the International Association for Relationship Research. <laughs> Establishing the journal and building the network <laughs> <laughs> provided critical foundations of support for scholars and their scholarship on communication and personal and social, social relationships. His pivotal work in developing the subfield of communication in personal relationships and his commitment to cultivating new scholars was recognized in 1991 when the Steve Duck New Scholar Award was established to acknowledge his vital contributions to the field of research on personal relationships. He has authored or co-authored 29 books, edited or co-edited 29 books, and published 108 chapters in 55 articles. This body of research has consistently charted the agenda for scholarship in interpersonal communication. For example, in the 1980s, interpersonal communication scholars had been inclined to study the influence of antecedent factors on relationship outcomes. In 1990, Duck wrote a landmark article entitled Relationships as Unfinished Business, in which he reminded interpersonal communication scholars of the central importance of process, what happens between antecedent factors and relationship outcomes. In this and other publications, Duck has guided the interpersonal communication discipline and other scholars to give priority not only to the phenomenon of relationships, but also to the communicative process of relating that brings relationships into being and sustains them. His substantial contributions to the field have been acknowledged by many prestigious awards, and we are delighted to add to that list. His excellence as a mentor of young scholars was recognized by the International Network on Personal Relationships Mentoring Award and the University of Iowa's Outstanding Mentor Award. Congratulations, Stephen Duck. Professor Karen Tracy is a discourse analyst whose work ranks among the top five to ten scholars internationally in the area of language and social interaction. She has a prolific record of publication with over 70 articles and book chapter publications, three books, and four co-edited volumes. Her book, Colloquium, Dilemmas of Academic Discourse, received the Language and Social Interaction Divisions Book Award in 1999, and her body of work challenges our assumptions about the banality of everyday talk. Indeed, it shows that while everyday talk may seem to lack eloquence, it carries purpose and is vitally important to constituting our sense of community. Her research is also noteworthy for her development with Robert Craig of Grounded Practical Theory, in which they advance a normative communication theory 
that derives from actual communication practices. Professor Tracy's work has at least five distinguishing marks that make her an exemplar of our discipline's best. First, her work blends a macro orientation to social problems of, significant, of significance, I've been talking a long time, with the micro analysis of discourse within a specific setting. Her most recent book, Challenges of Ordinary Democracy, provides careful analysis of citizen statements, thus offering insight into how ordinary citizens understand democracy and what they expect of their democratically elected representatives and what counts as a democratically run meeting. Her analysis goes beyond how we theorize democracy to investigate how ordinary citizens live it or believe it should be lived. Second, her work displays unusual creativity by challenging our assumptions about the banality of everyday talk and examining the profound consequences that it can have for social life. Third, her use of the grounded practical paradigm explains how humans communicate using their personal theory of what constitutes good communication. In addition, her work illustrates how these theories provide a basis for understanding how we act through communication. Fourth, her work speaks across traditions, offering insights as valuable to rhetoricians as the specialists in language and social interaction. And finally, Professor Tracy's research displays an uncommon commitment to mentoring junior scholars. Her joint publications with graduate students are remarkable making her a role model for the discipline. Congratulations, Karen Tracy. <laughs> Professor Joseph Turow is a wide-ranging, original, provocative scholar. His work engages questions that are central to the study of the institutions of communication. Further, Turo's questions are indicative of his insight into the future of media institutions. A sampling of the comments from reviewers of a single work of his suggests the breadth and impact of his scholarship. Publishers Weekly noted of Niche Envy, this fascinating and disturbing study considers the new database marketing which, with which corporations delve deeply into customers personal histories and interests using digital surveillance technology. The Chronicle of Higher Education described the same book as a lucid and unnerving read on the growing uses of database marketing. Information, Communication, and Society summarized the case for Thoreau's importance as a scholar by saying his major strength is his critical analysis of the society and ethical implications of the intrusion into privacy of consumers and the quiet undermining of trust. As a public intellectual, Professor Thoreau is among a handful of scholars to whom the New York Times regularly turns for informed commentary on media systems. For example, in September of 2009, the New York Times devoted a full or article to his report on the impact of tailored advertising. And then later in that same year in December, the Times quoted the views he had, he had expressed at the Federal Trade Commission's roundtable on privacy. In other media venues, he has been quoted on cell phone privacy, decapitalizing the word internet, on the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, on target marketing, and on media and social segmentation. We are pleased to confer this honor on Professor Tyrrell, congratulations. <laughs> well, this concludes our celebration and our uh, 2010 award ceremony. Congratulations to all of our award recipients and congratulations. Yes. And congratulations to Dawn Braithwaite on easing into her past presidential <laughs> role. <laughs> I
I'd like to gavel us to a close and invite you all to have a glass of champagne to toast our award recipients and toast each other. Thank you very much for being here.